Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm James Craig, the Technical Program Manager for IEA GHG, um, and welcome to this uh, webinar um, entitled Opportunity CO2 Data Share as a Central Digital Portal for Curtailing and Sharing ACT Project Data. This is very much uh, a webinar focused uh, for those involved in ACT projects, but it has broader applications as we shall find. And Tom, if you could move to the next slide, please. So just um, a qualifier, we are a uh, techni technical collaboration program. We are affiliated to the IEA, but we um, are uh, separate and legally autonomous from it. So any views that we uh, hold are those of this program and not necessarily representative of the IEA. And if you could move to the next slide, please. So just as a way briefly, as a way of background, this is uh, fourth in a series of uh, webinars that we have held on the data share program and shortly Greta will give you a brief update on the concept of CO2 data share um, and we will have um, YouTube recordings of our former webinars if you're interested in those and also uh, I'm sure publications on it so if you could move to the next slide please so um, as I said uh, Greta Tangen from Sintef is going to give a short recap of the CO2 data share setup. Um, the value of data sharing is going to be given by Darren uh, Daminani from the US Department of Energy. Uh, then we are going to have some um, input on data owners also by Darren and Philip Ringrose of Equinor. Unfortunately, Sally Greenberg was unable to be with us. However, we do have Odd Anderson, who is uh, responsible for much of the technical development of CO2 data share. He's also available for uh, questions. So when we have uh, run through um, the sequence of presentations, there will be an opportunity for questions an answer discussion and I would urge you to put your questions in the chat function and submit that to uh, me uh, and then at the end we um, can exchange questions and um, hopefully answer your queries. So um, Tom, if you could now bring in uh, Greta to take on the next stage of the presentation. Oh, and don't forget, um, GHGT 16, uh, as you know, is the biggest uh, conference on carbon capture and storage and related issues like utilization of transport. Uh, so an opportunity, if you're not aware, to attend the big conference, which is this year is live, I'm pleased to say, and will be held in the French city of Lyon at the end of October. Um, and if you go to our website, you can find more information on that. So, uh, Greta, uh, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you for that nice introduction and thank you to all for the opportunity to, uh, to present CO2 data share and to discuss the potentials for a collaboration with the ACT projects. Uh, I will start by giving a brief presentation of the portal. Um, CO2, uh, and Tom, you, please, you can just uh, switch to the next slide. Then you can go one more. Thank you. Great. Great, thank you. Yeah, CO2 Data Share is an open access digital portal for sharing quality data sets from CCS projects. 
Uh, and the purpose is to uh, be a resource to the international research community uh, working to accelerate CCS research and also the deployment of CCS uh, globally. Uh, the, this online portal is developed by Sintef with the financial support from uh, Gasnova through the CLIMIT program and US Department of Energy. And it has been a collaboration between uh, Sintef, Equinor, U University of Illinois, and IEA, GHG. Uh, it was launched in 2020. And since then, the portal has shared uh, various data sets, uh, which I will come back to. Uh, next, please. Um, and as you well know, CCS is one of the important measures for us to reduce the CO2 emissions. Uh, but a significant increase is required, both with respect to, to scale and also the pace of develop, uh, deployment. Um, and there are many CCS projects ongoing. There is much uh, research. Uh, it is pilot uh, projects, demonstration and industry projects. Um, and we believe that uh, the international sharing of preference data from these projects can enable a faster development of cost-efficient and safe CCS technology around the world. Uh, and ACT alone has awarded 20 international CCS uh, R&D projects, and many of them, if not all, will generate data. And at the same time, q to data share represents a digital framework for sharing data. This has been the background for the dialogue initiated between the ACT Consortium and CO2 Data Share. We wanted to look into the opportunities of developing CO2 Data Share as a digital portal for the ACT project portfolio. Um, next, please. So, how does this digital portal work? Um, the data sets are shared on an online portal freely accessible to all. Um, this web interface is developed uh, from an open source software called Sika and it's hosted on the Norwegian national infrastructure that is managed by Uninet Sigma 2. Uh, and the goal has been to provide a simple and low cost solution for making data easily available, easy to find and also well documented and with clear uh, licensing terms. Uh, and as a general recommendation, we have uh, we uh, have uh, aimed for making the data sets available uh, freely, publicly, publicly um, on the uh, on the portal. Uh, <coughs> have some options for access control that could be activated. Um, for the current data sets, uh, the terms of use are defined through a uh, so-called uh, Creative Commons license. It's a uh, license for, uh, for sharing um, information and with only so a few minor adjustments to it. So it's, uh, it's, it's an open license um, and the terms of use uh, are, yeah, allows open sharing of this data. Um, next, please. Um, the CO2 uh, data share portal was launched in February 2020, and the two first data sets to be shared was related to the, the ongoing Sleipner CO2 storage project. Uh, we shared a new uh, benchmark simulation model and also uh, a set of 40 seismic data. Uh, the next project uh, with data that we have been sharing is the, the related, related to the Smeaheia CO2 storage prospect. In this uh, data set, uh, extensive amounts of data that are generated by Equinor and Gasnova uh, in two feasibility studies are shared. Uh, and the data sets include uh, subsurface data, reports and geo models related to the assessment of uh, a proposed storage site in the Smeaheia region. Um, next, please. Yeah, uh, and, and these days we are very proud to present the first US data sets. Uh, these are selected data sets from the Illinois Basin Decatur project. 
And in this project, over three years, about 1 million tons of CO2 uh, captured from the ethanol production plant at the Archer Daniels Midland facility in Decatur, Illinois, has been injected into Mount uh, Simon sandstone. And we plan to share uh, data sets from the whole workflow uh, of this project, from the site characterization and to injection and post-injection monitoring. Uh, so we will be sharing 3D seismic and, uh, and micro seismic, well information, geological model, and uh, several reports. And this is a, an important milestone for us in the project, demonstrating that CO2 data share is a portal for international data sets. Mm -hmm. Next, please. Yes, this picture illustrates uh, the wide range of data types we, we do cover, even though we so far have, have been only sharing uh, CO2 storage data uh, and um, uh, yeah, data sets from CO2 uh, storage. Um, this example is from the Smea Heia data set, and we can see that we are sharing seismic data, we are sharing well reports, geomechanical data, pressure, temperature, simulation models, and in Decatur, we also will include micro seismic data. So, in principle, there are no limitations to what kind of data uh, we can share. It could be physical data that is generated in the field or in the lab, it can be synthetic data, and it can be models. Um, and so far, we have been focusing on CO2 storage data. Uh, but our ambition is to expand so that the portal can enable sharing of data covering the whole chain, including capture, transport, and storage. And then we need to, to establish the metadata structure that allows uh, a wider range of, of data sets. Um, next, please. Yeah, this, this CO2 uh, storage, uh, CO2 data share portal keeps statistics on the downloads. Uh, and we, there we can see the great international interest in the release data sets. By February this year, more than 15,000 uh, downloads have been recorded uh, from the portal. Uh, but we, you should notice that the CO2 data share is more than a repository for data. We, we aim to share, uh, prepare and share selected uh, data sets that are thought to be of high value um, to the wider research community. So a question for us to discuss um, uh, with you and today is what data will be of relevance to the international CCS community? Um, data sets will, that will benefit from high visibility and long-term access. And more specifically, um, what data from the ACT projects have the potential to, to accelerate the in international research on CCS? Um, next, please. Thank you. So, um, what does it take to share the data? Um, um, a goal uh, of CO2 data share is to provide quality assured data that is well documented. And therefore, it's not possible to just freely upload uh, data yourself. Um, the preparation and uploading of the data is a col collaborative process where CO2 data share works with the data owner to assure that all qu quality criteria are met. Uh, and one task um, is to define the metadata for the data, data sets. Um, another one is to document and uh, make an online presentation. Um, because, and um, for this, um, each data set has an individual customized landing page, which gives uh, the users an overview of the data sets. It can include text, illustrations and tables, and also reference to other documentation. Um, the idea is to provide enough information so that the, the data is, uh, is understood and, and the users are, are able to use this data uh, correctly. Um, and of course, the data sets to share are selected by the projects. Um, and they will not be uh, shared publicly until they are 
carefully uh, quality assured so that we uh, are sure that there are no errors that uh, uh, that are uh, in this uh, in the in the data sets and also in some cases it might be relevant to await maybe that the data sets are used for analysis as part of the research project that are within um, but uh, before but when they are ready for publications it is important that they are actually properly documented in the landing page and that the conditions for sharing and terms of use uh, are defined so we need a, a license uh, that the users must accept before they download before they are able to download the, the data sets um, and the goal has been to to assist data owners uh, reduce the cost uh, uh, of data preparation and sharing um, and to enable reuse of data by other users and by this enable data owners to have more insights into their own research provided by international researchers using their data. Uh, for many data owners, visibility is, uh, is relevant and that could include academic citations. So each data set is given a, a digital object identifier, so it's easy to, to uh, re refer to the data sets when they are used in, in research and public uh, yeah, reported in publications. Yeah, next, please. Um, so for the data users, um, um, the, the main benefit of having such a portal for get, getting access to data is it's so easy to discover the data. It's easy to get hold of them and to be able to download them um, from a, a single point of access to, uh, to, to the research data. Um, and for the users, of course, it's important to have the proper documentation so that they're able to use this data as they were in intended. Um, and uh, when, uh, um, um, when sharing the results from research, new research based on data made available, uh, the data sets actually can be shared at the same time so that when others read about research, they can, can um, use the same set of data to conduct their own research. And this provides a common ground for international collaboration. Uh, and one example uh, is a coordinated initiative that was made by Klimit through Gasnova. They invited researchers to participate in a benchmark study um, on CO2 plume dynamics using the new Sleipner benchmark model. So in the webinar, the main results from five different studies based on, the, on this model were presented. Uh, next, please. So following the dialogue uh, between the ACT Consortium and the CO2 Data Share Consortium, which Darren will uh, say a little bit more about, um, a possible next step uh, we consider to be to develop a trial project where we explore the opportunity to establish CO2 Data Share as a common digital platform for sharing data generated in ACT projects. And in such a project, we should, we should aim for advancing the portal to cover the whole CCS chain, um, develop the administrative procedures that are required um, um, to prepare and share data from the app project, and for each data set, work with the data owner to prepare and share uh, the data. And our, our vision is that um, not only uh, we should not only invest in new projects and new research infrastructure, but also invest in efficient sharing of knowledge and data that is already generated uh, to leverage from these previous investments. Um, yeah, and by this, I think I will give the word to Darren. Okay, share my camera. Okay, very good. Thank you very much, Greta. Um, so my name is Darren Damiani. I am the Carbon Transport and Storage Program Manager for the DOE Office of Fossil Energy 
and carbon management. Uh, first, I want to thank all the ACT participants for joining this webinar. I really appreciate that you taking the time uh, to listen to us talk about CO2 data share and why we think uh, that the CO2 data share and ACT is a, is a really good fit. Um, as many of you know, DOE is part of ACT. We fund uh, or participate in that initiative. I think we're supporting seven or more projects within ACT, and then we, we view that as a, as a fantastic way of leveraging our program dollars and working cooperatively with other countries on research so that uh, we all benefit from the research, but as I say, it's leveraged, so at the kind of reduced cost to all of us. So it's a really great, um, it, it's, a, it's a great that ACT exists, and we hope that it, that it prospers. Um, so for I'm going to talk a little, little bit about the value of linking of CO2 data share with ACT. I, I want to point your attention to that first bullet. The digitalization of CCS research data is an important trend in publishing and sharing scientific data. I think this is something that everybody knows with an ACT and all researchers know that, that uh, the digitization of their information and the distribution of information uh, accelerates research and it can accelerate uh, technologies in CCS. That part is not new. DOE has been doing a lot of investing in that. We have the energy data exchange, we archive our data, we make it freely available uh, to, to other researchers. We're starting to take advantage of the di uh, data sciences and thinking about you know, cloud computing and, and cloud storage and integration of data systems. And it all gets very complicated very quickly. But CCS is growing globally, not just in the United States. And more and more data is becoming available and generated around the world. And there really is no platform, at least that I'm aware of, where that data is kind of being uh, compiled in a, in a certain place such that the research community internationally can access it. And that's really what the point of CO2 data share is, as Greta had pointed out, is to provide that platform, a simple platform, such that very high value data sets can be made available to anyone in the world. Um, and we see great advantage to that because having that portal makes it much easier to find that information. We already know and studies have shown that a tremendous amount of time uh, from researchers is just locating the data. So that's really one of the, the, the birth of CO2 data share, why, why it exists and why we're trying to grow it. So in that last bullet, CO2 data share is a bridge that can further connect ACT to, to key stakeholders and servicing the global energy transition is really the main goal of what CO2 data share is. It's a, it's a place that, that very important information that can be used for research can be easily found and downloaded and with assurances that it's quality checked and vetted. And with that, with those, well, just think for a matter if, if universities were to use that for their students, they're all using that same data set. So there's a good constraint there in that comparative research then uh, it is, has even greater value. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so one of the big questions, we've heard this uh, from, from others in ACT on, on the side, is that, well, what, what, what do you actually mean by data? I mean, you know, you might think initially, okay, well, it's a spreadsheet or a database of various, you know, um, results of, of, of research. Okay, yes, that's true. That's what we traditionally think of data. But data can actually be quite a few things. It could be not just your project findings. They could be synthetic data sets that were generated that were then maybe used to develop tools or some other research. It could be integration of existing data sets that you're using that are put in such a form that could also then be used by others uh, for uh, additional research. It could be the R&D tools that you develop, tools that then you'd like to have others to use, could be open data source or just to have you know, them applied in different uh, applications. Computer code is another form of data that, that is often generated. So, I mean, and the list goes on. The data really, what, what we really seek is just any really, data in any form that can be shared freely and is useful to others. So we don't want to, the, the spectrum is broad. Um, it's not limited. We, we see that data can be available, uh, data can be of all types that can be of use. And this is, as, as Greta had pointed out, possibly through the whole value chain of CCS, so capture, storage, and utilization. We had originally envisioned CO2 data share as a storage piece, but there's, there could definitely be value if there's 
uh, data that's of use from the capture and utilization side. There's no reason why we couldn't uh, share that within CO2 data share as well. Next slide, please. So also important is what CO2 data share is not. And CO2 data share is definitely not just an administrative tool in a data warehouse. We don't want to gather up all your information, put it in a digital box and stick it on a digital shelf in a digital warehouse. That is not what this is. What we seek, as Greta had said, was to curate high value quality assured data that are useful to the international R&D community and CCS stakeholders. So we're not, again, what we want to do is try to identify those data sets within or those called data products within ACT projects that are of value and that will be worthy of putting up on CO2 data share. And really importantly is that value of the data is not assessed by us. And by us, I mean the CO2 data share steering committee. It's, it's, it's a value, the value is, is assessed by the owner of the data that created it. And so for some examples, <clears throat> Greta had mentioned the Illinois data the Illinois Basin Decatur project and their donation of a subset of the micro seismic data that came from that project. And that was a, uh, they're, they're injecting a million tons per year in the Mount Simon sandstone. That project's been going on for some, quite some time. And they've been, they've been collecting micro seismic data now for a number of years. And the data set, a subset of that data will be uploaded into CO2 data share. There's the value of doing that is actually good for both Illinois Geologic Survey, the only State Geologic Survey, DOE, and the researchers that could possibly use it. In that data, they've, they've done research on it, but by making that available, now research can do additional research and make more discoveries on the, the geophysics uh, response to CO2 in data share. So researchers all over the world will have access to that and start doing various studies. This is a great benefit the ISGS, the uh, Illinois uh, State Geological Survey, because that tells them more about what's happening in the Mount Simon Sandstone, which for the U.S. is a very vast and large potential uh, CO2 uh, resource for storage. It's good for DOE because that helps us. Uh, that information then can be used as we expand CCS in that basin, which is, like I said, quite large. And we are funding new projects that will be in that basin so we can use that. And of course, the researchers benefit because they have ideas about what they want to investigate. So that value is spread around all three of us, from, from the data owner to the, the funding organization and to the researcher. The same thing can be said, the Sleipner's uh, data that Equinor put up onto CO2 data share, and that's the Sleipner 2019 benchmark model and the 40 seismic set, and they've also uh, uh, uploaded the Snehaya data set. Same thing for Equinor. Equinor very carefully put up a vetted data set for researchers to have access to, to possibly learn again more about how the Sleipen reservoirs are responding to CO2 injection, maybe learning more about this, the uh, pressure and flow dynamics. That information is extremely, if researchers were to do that and to publish that, that's extremely valuable to Equinor. Not only at the Sleipners, but it could also be useful in their work uh, at the Northern Lights, which is a component of the Longship project, which is coming up. Uh, and again, the researchers that uh, now have access to that information get uh, the benefit of doing that research and making new discoveries. So it's exactly the same model. So this is the kind of, this is how the value we see is working and what we want to do um, in, with ACT. That is that all, the, all of the ACT projects will be generating data products of some kind. Not all of them will be deemed uh, of value to the owner, but what we're asking is that we work with the, the ACT projects, with the, the, the data owners, to see if that has value, to see if those projects fit this objective that we're after. And of course, if any project, if any of the ACT projects are listening, they feel like they may have data or will have data that fits that objective, then what we'd like to do then is to continue to that discussion with you. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and finally, and this is a really important point. What we're doing right now, this effort to curate data from ACT, this is a trial project, as Greta said. Um, it, it is, it's a trial project to demonstrate the value of CO2 data share. Um, it's 
been funded by the U.S. and Norway to this point. We've approached the app consortium and told them basically what we're telling you, and they have expressed interest. They'd like to see if this could actually work, and they agreed to doing the trial. Um, but when you do that, um, we have to uh, demonstrate that there's success, right? So there has to be a successful outcome. Um, and those th uh, three bullets there on the bottom kind of represent a short-term, mid-term, and long-term uh, successful outcome as we're defining it. So first, it's a very obvious one, successful curation of several high-value data products from ACT, right? If we're able to identify some of those, work with the ACT projects, put something together and put it into CO2 data share, which then, of course, would be socialized through the various international um, organizations and initiatives that are going on, CSLF, CEM, uh, the, the task, uh, uh, the working groups and IEA, <clears throat> all of that can be, we can socialize that to all of them. The second more midterm is the download tracking. And this is really important and particularly for government agencies like myself, who want to see that that data is being used. It's one thing to take data, put it in a, uh, in a portal and say, you know, here's the data, but if no one's downloading it, then it's not really, has, doesn't have much value. And as, as Greta had pointed out, we've had tremendous uh, downloads of, uh, of the, uh, the data sets that are currently in CO2 data share now. So we know there's interest. We know people want this information. And then thirdly is the citation tracking. This is later down the road. And by that, I mean, we're tracking projects that are citing the data products within CO2 data share so that we can see that those that data is actually generating new research and new findings. But as I said, it's down the road. So with those three outcomes, which is what we're hoping to achieve, we hope this will create incentive for other countries to invest in CO2 data shares growth and sustained operation. So they said, this is a trial run just to show that this can work. Um, our goal ultimately is that we're gonna need multiple countries to invest in CO2 data share. And the, and the beauty of CO2 data share is they can measure that return on investment through that usage and data product citation statistics. And again, from a funding organization like where I'm coming from, that's critically important. And I think it's one of the reasons why a consortium is interested in and other funding agencies, because they want to see, not only are they investing in a project that's gonna generate findings, but they're also gonna to want to see that those findings are being used in other research and, and therefore fulfilling their goal of accelerating the, the technology development. So CO2 data share really is a platform for trying to facilitate all of this. We're trying to be very specific, not just data gatherers, but identifying those data sets that we feel like researchers can use to accelerate, which is the goal of ACT, and it's the goal of all of us to accelerate CCUS uh, globally, CCUS technologies globally. So with that, I'll end there. Um, I did talk a little bit, I know there's a section of uh, talking about the value uh, from the data owner side, I kind of gave my perspective because, you know, Sally Greenberg wasn't able to join us. I mean, she is the data owner, but that's the organization or the funding organization that funded that research. I'm, I think I've kind of covered what the value is for them. Uh, and I covered a little bit for Philip as well. Um, and maybe for, perhaps Philip may want to add uh, another note to that, but if you want, we can move into uh, the, the uh, Q&A at that point. Thank you. Sure, uh, Darren. Uh, maybe I can add one one comment sure. to your very nice, for your very mm -hmm. nice pitch from from an industry point of view. Is is the two things that I I recall with sharing the Sleipner data set is that the the immediate value was just facilitating data sharing because we got asked on a one by one basis, and now you know. It, that that route is facilitated, so we very much appreciate the practicalities of it. But I, I think the the real long term value is the business value because there's a lot of, if you like, misunderstandings in CCS. And by sharing data, what we find is that we're building confidence in the whole of the, you know, of the project value chain, and you know, and that has enormous value to to any company wanting to grow business in this domain. Otherwise, I fully agree with you, or I agree with you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So, Craig, I can turn it over to you. We can we can move yeah. to uh, some questions. We want to leave plenty of time. So, uh, 
yes, thank you very much. Um, excellent coverage there. Um, there are uh, one or two questions that have cropped up. Uh, one of them's quite specific. It's um, it's asking, will the data set include an analysis of CO2 itself? Quality and conditions of CO2 are important for utilization technologies. And I, I don't know uh, from which ACT project this came, but I suspect it's, it's to do with capture and then onward use of CO2. Uh, and there is another question, but I, I just wonder uh, what comments you might have for your response to that. So I, mean, I, I can kick me. off. I could kick off with that, James, and maybe Greta wants to add. But as Greta said at the beginning, we do want to include capture data. We don't at yeah. the moment, but but you know, if somebody wanted to offer capture stream content of the CO2, uh, that would be great. <laughs> um, pure CO2 is a well-known substance, which this public domain information on the equation of state and the phase behavior but mm. what's interesting in this is if if there are minor components in the co2 yeah sure so i i would just say yes please <laughs> <laughs> who who would like to share some data <laughs> that that uh, does uh, a broader question and it, this was um sort of mentioned i think greta mentioned it and that was the quality assurance of the data uh, its curation. I just wondered, in this whole uh, operation of CO2 data share, who would, who's going to check, who's going to be responsible for the data quality? The, um, the quality of the data as such in the data set, that is the responsibility, the responsibility of the data owner. The data okay. share is not able to quality assure the content of the data files that we receive so that is something that the data owner needs to take responsibility for but we can quality uh, quali have quality assurance of how this is structured and we we can also uh, to some extent uh, have, uh, yeah, help the data owners to do this but uh, in general, it is the data owner that need to, to, to take responsibility of yeah. the quality of the data. As, yeah. There, and I, another... I... I'm sorry. Well, just, just a qualifying remark on that. I'm assuming that the data is supplied to you, but it has some documentation which A, puts a, 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 a clause in it, which says almost not quite a disclaimer, but a clause to say, this is our data. To the best of our knowledge, this is the quality. And we all know that sometimes data from an interim uh, field survey is not the same as something at the end of it, but there's a qualifying document. Is that yeah, a fair assumption? Yes, that's that's correct. That's exactly how it is uh, presented. But oh, and of course, the, there might be uh, errors. There might be uh, some things in that data that uh, is not perfectly correct. And there are some. Uh, yeah, the the data owner uh, to make that statement that to to the best of their knowledge, this is uh, quality assured. Okay. Yeah, but Thank you. Current, no guarantees. <laughs> I'll so, just add one more piece that, and I don't want to speak for Philip, but I know that that Equinor was very careful in the quality of the data uh, that they put up, and so they they spent quite some time on that. But another incredibly important piece of the data is the metadata, and that's another piece that we work with uh, data owners to make sure that we use a consistent metadata schema and discuss those things, so that all of that is very well documented. So that, mm -hmm. and of course, and, and again, I want to speak for Greta, but you know, there's terms of use, there's all sorts of uh, uh, provisions put in place so that the data owner is comfortable with sharing that information. Okay. So if um, somebody had a large data set, say some seismic profiles, uh, 4D seismic, uh, showing um, CO2 plume over time, I mean, mm -hmm. Is, is there a constraint on the data size and how would uh, a researcher who may who may wish to contribute how, how would they go about doing that 
yeah, when it comes to the actual site, I would like to invite Odd into the discussion because he is the one that is actually uh, making this happen on the technical side. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. No? Yes, uh, there are no um, limits on the size of the data per se. Uh, so far, we have stored the, data, the sizes of the data sets have been up to uh, yeah, the order of magnitude of 100 gigabytes about. It could also be larger, but, uh, but uh, the most important is that it's actually data that has been selected to be useful. Mm. I can add one an interesting detail about the Illinois Basin Decatur project, microseismic data. That data volume is absolutely huge. It is it's so big that it's not something that we can actually transmit over to to say even even within the United States, the, we had to put it on a physical device to get it into EDX. So what we've done is we've taken a subset of that microseismic data set that's representative of a particularly interesting interval injection. And, However, that the larger kind of raw microseismic data is still sitting within our energy data exchange and can be accessed. That subset is something that a researcher could look at. It's a smaller volume, yeah. but if they decided, I need more than that, I'd like to see more of the raw data, then they'll have that link to that larger data set and then can work with the data owner to acquire even more. So the portal is still, it can, if we wanted to keep things uh, more, um, what's the word, you know, just less, you know, intensive in terms of data volumes. In some, and, and, and it sounds like odd to saying we can, but we may set up situations such that we have uh, portions of, of data and then pointers to the very large data set and where that can be found. It certainly can be done. Yeah, you make a very good point, Darren, is that the point is to share subsets of data that are useful. Uh, um, yeah. and, and what I would maybe add is that in, in sharing, for example, the Sleipner data set, which we'd had worked on for many years, an important part of the process was sharing it to Sintef and to Odd Anderson and others and saying, can you read this data? Is it in a format which is understandable? Is the metadata useful? So a, a lot of the quality control is is getting the data into a form that non-specialists can understand. And hmm. that's probably the most time-consuming process. But at the end of the day, it's very useful. And we uh, don't always get it right. <laughs> uh, the, the sort of, just a sort of thought on this that, I mean, micro-seismic data, and that Darren mentioned, is, is really important because it's um, highly relevant to um, the integrity of CO2 storage, but supposing uh, in the future there were a number of sites uh, monitoring micro seismic activity, might might it be possible within CO2 data share to have some a section of it so that there could be maybe a comparison of different sites? I mean, is that the sort of thing that might be possible in the future? Absolutely, and I think, and this is where I think Philip made uh, uh, the arguments very early on in CO2 data share, is that it's not just individual data sets. You, you, if we can put together data sets that are comparative, that could be used together. So, for example, there may be a, uh, another set of uh, another bench scale, another benchmark model, another 4D seismic data set. And, and yet in, in the third or a fourth, right? That offers opportunities then to do that cross comparative, right? Kind of mm. say, Philip, that that's kind of what we had talked about very early on. Absolutely. And you know, you probably is going to start with a research project. If you're linking to ACT here is that if an ACT research project was to do an interesting comparison between two or three or four sites, that could form the basis of a data set that could be useful yeah. to the wider community. You can say, hey, we compared Sleipner to California, <laughs> uh, and we found that two completely different sites um, behave fairly similarly or not. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like it has uh, real, real potential here. Um, 
And maybe, I, I don't know what the conditions are on ACT projects, but uh, if in the future research projects could be, uh, not only are they um, uh, one of the conditions for publication, but maybe for releasing data that they produce, and therefore CO2 data share would be a very valuable resource for them to do that, because it has genuine global reach. And as Darren said, uh, it's pretty clear now that uh, CCS and CO2 storage uh, is that there is a growing uh, interest and real genuine activity. And operators are going to want to know, uh, you know, not everybody's going to be up the same speed, but they're going to want to know um, what has happened at other sites. I, I just wonder whether there may be some in the future that if we get a lot of data coming in from, from different projects, that we almost have a kind of virtual conference which shows data on the CO2 data share. I don't know, any, any thoughts on that one? We don't really know where this is going to go, but Darren talked about the fact that, you know, di digital data is is in a revolution at the moment. It, it's proliferating mm -hmm. in all sorts of ways with machine learning, artificial intelligence. Yeah. And so we don't really know where this will go, but I think, you know, what we're doing with this particular data platform is participating yeah. in that discussion of digital data sharing, which which is going to benefit, <laughs> yes, no doubt. And if somebody has a creative idea about what kind of data could be shared, you know, we'd like to hear it. Yes, indeed. I would also add that, you know, the CO2 data share, and, and Odd can talk about this and get into the real details, it's built on the CCAN platform. So you can build in all sorts of capabilities within the, the, the platform itself, not just to, to, you know, curate and share data. There's functionality that can be built in over time as we start to see those values <laughs> in their head, just as we've been speculating. But we've got to get the data in there first, right? We're starting, to, if we start to procure, we start looking at ACT and other initiatives that, stand, that are standing up globally and that have high visibility within the international community, those questions start to rise. Okay, now what functionality can we do with this data that's already in there that goes beyond just the curation and the sharing piece? So, you know, we could speculate to do all manner of things and there's api mm -hmm. connection you can federate to other databases there's many avenues you can take and leverage this kind of revolution in data science but it, what's so nice about at least the co2 data share platform in its infancy is that it does provide that access that immediate access to information that you can start working on and so we start there and we build but as a trial effort you have to kind of demonstrate that kind of stand it up show that this is a, gr a great place to to to, uh, uh, to curate and manage that information, and then see and track how those researchers are using it. And then, as we move forward, we can have new phases of development for capabilities. Mm. Hmm. Hmm. What I could add also, Darren, is that uh, and James also touched into it uh, the kind of the, the global reach of this. We, I think it's quite surprised us because. Uh, from the downloads, we see that it's downloaded by uh, more than 50 countries. So it's uh, it's not like a few uh, research communities in a few countries, but it's uh, people in very many countries that actually download this uh, data and use them. It's a good start. It, it's good to know that, you know, <laughs> In its, in its very early stage, we're already getting a lot of activity. Um, and so hopefully to act researchers who have an interest, well, I have, let's, let me, I'll back up. Here's another data set that's very likely going to come into CO2 data share. I'm in the middle, I'm negotiating with the folks who are uh, running these, uh, the DOE initiative called SMART. It's the uh, science informed machine learning to accelerate, accelerate real-time decision-making. They are, they're working on taking machine learning and applying it to challenging, uh, challenging problems of the subsurface to, to make visualization more intuitive, 
to make decisions more rapidly by developing reduced order models and using the uh, an artificial intelligence as a way of, well, they're doing very robust physics-based modeling to then do the recognition and the, and the, uh, the learning piece to accelerate all of this. I'm bringing it up because they're using a very large synthetic data set. That data set can be uploaded into CO2 data share and others can do exactly the same thing. And in fact, the tools that they're building from that synthetic data set can also be put into CO2 data share so that others can use those tools uh, and either uh, and test them out further or try uh, you know, different approaches. It's all open source, mm -hmm. but <clears throat> that broadens our reach. It broadens DOE's reach, right? We're investing in this. Make it available to the international community. We can get, we, the United States, can get a lot more out of it because there's so many more researchers that have access to it and can be working on it and publishing on that, which then can be incorporated into our program. So um, hmm. that's that's coming, and I'm, I'm kind of announcing it now. <laughs> I am talking about Good. that. You but, heard it. Yeah, that's what's coming next. So that'll be our first synthetic data set, which is another popular trend. Uh, there's some very good yeah. work on synthetic data sets, uh, for, particularly for machine learning applications, but it could be for, for many others. So. Uh, you heard it here first. Now, I'm assuming um, that Greta mentioned the uh, global interest in CO2 data share. I'm assuming that, say, more sophisticated analysis of data is going to be open to anybody who get, has access to CO2 data share in the now and in the future. Would I, is that a correct assumption? Now I didn't catch your question, James. You well, said I, I, what I'm saying is that, that Darren's talking about this, you know, say for example, these synthetic data sets, which mm -hmm. researchers could use. I'm assuming that researchers in other parts of the world, sort of not necessarily in the United States, could have access to it and use it to build their expertise. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, as I mentioned before, I see tremendous value on the university side and in education, these, these data being available for, for people who work on their masters or postdoc or even undergrad. Yeah. So uh, uh, another question just come in here. Um, it says, where is the data stored? Is it on a cloud or on local machines? And how is the future perspective concerning much larger data sets? And I know that you sort of answered some of those questions, but uh, your views uh, on that just, I think, for clarification as well. Yeah, and, uh, and I think I will invite Odd again to uh, comment on it's stored on the national e-infrastructure in Norway, but uh, I would invite Odd to elaborate on that a little bit. Yes, we, uh, we chose uh, to use uh, Sigma2, which is a provider in Norway for, the, um, for providing e-infrastructure in terms of storage and also computing to the academic sector. They had a good pricing model, and they also have um, uh, equipments that can host, uh, that can run heavy applications and uh, store large amounts of data. So we are actually uh, so far using a relatively small um, amount of, of data compared to the capacity. But uh, uh, yeah, so this, the storage will allow to store much larger data as well. But uh, Issue is to facilitate this the download in a in a in an mm. easy way uh, that can be um, uh, interrupted and restarted and, and so on. But on would you say this, Darren, that that it's it's really just a matter of capability, right? I mean, you can expand on on space as as needed. That of course means money. Right? It requires money to do that. But but yeah. you can broadened as needed as it grows and as interest grows and if and if the investments are such that we can grow it it can be done yes right now we pay very little for the actual storage space because uh, the limit i mean the, the data set is still of limited size uh, so of course if we are to expand a lot it will also cost a little bit more to store it but uh, but uh, it's um, it's completely possible yes 
Very good. It was interesting that in Greta's list of who is downloading the data, uh, South Korea and Indonesia appeared very high on the list. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I happen to know that those are countries very serious about developing CCS projects mm -hmm. right now. So, you know, I, I think there's a bit of credit to to you and the gang, Greta, because, you know, the, the data share is actually helping to accelerate CCS in countries mm -hmm. that are serious about it, <laughs> um, which is which is good news because, you know, the, the fact that the data is not just being used in Norway and the United States is yeah. actually good for CCS. <laughs> hmm. Absolutely. So um, we're sort of coming to the close of this webinar. Um, I think as time goes on, we will certainly be holding other webinars on CO2 data share because I think this is a very exciting project. I think you've heard that there is huge potential for individual projects and indeed uh, collective projects in the future. It's a tool which has got very broad application and as we've just uh, heard um, it's, it's having increasing international importance which is where CCS and climate change mitigation needs to go. So um, as IEA GHG we will uh, be putting a, a recording of this webinar and, and we will get that onto the ACT website for uh, reference to those in ACT projects who are not able to attend today. If you have further questions about this or any aspects of CO2 data share or indeed IHGHG, please get in contact. Uh, we will endeavour to address that. Uh, I just will give a little bit of a plug um, that we do, we do run a series of webinars mostly on uh, research projects that we fund. So please watch out. If you're not on our uh, mailing list, then I would urge you to do so. And finally, I would like to thank uh, my uh, fellow panelists, that's Greta Odd, who you can't see, Darren and Philip. And I'd like to thank you all for attending and participating. Look forward to seeing you on the next webinar. Thank you very much. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. So, this much.